tells you in this lifetime, this is forever the first artist that OBO ever had and still has, and OBO XO is alive forever, I promise. The son of an Ethiopian immigrant and apparently a pineapple, The Weeknd was born in February of 1990 in The Six. And apparently the first 20 years of The Weeknd's life was a cavalcade of substance abuse, which he described as the movie Kids Without the AIDS. Ironically, Kids Without the AIDS also being what Charlie Sheen promised all those hooers. But it turns out that unlike that friend of yours from uni that's still trying to make it as a DJ at age 35, The Weeknd was able to turn 20 years of nasal drips and K-holes into something productive. Combining these dark, moody perspectives with a voice as pitch perfect as Michael Jackson's when his dad is standing over his shoulder with a switch. The Weeknd dropped his first real mixtape, House of Balloons, in March of 2011, and it was hailed as an instant classic. But he'd been putting in work uploading songs to YouTube for quite some time at this point, having dropped the tracks What You Need, Loft Music, and The Morning on YouTube earlier in 2010. And these uploads actually caught the attention of Drake's manager Oliver, who reposted them on the OVO blog in December 2010. And apparently Drake wasn't even that into The Weeknd's music at this time, but eventually he came around and was impressed by the young man's talent eventually going along to several of his shows in Toronto, and going on to plug him publicly on his Twitter around March of 2011, and beginning to openly promote a partnership between their two respective crews, OVO, EXO. Drizzy continued to show love by bringing The Weeknd out at numerous shows in the city, as well as Drake's recently launched OVO Festival, where Drake was actually seen singing The Weeknd's praises whilst wearing an Everlast boxing robe, looking like he just went 12 rounds with that pussy. From there, in August 2011, Drake actually popped up on the song The Zone with the weekend on his latest mixtape Thursday. And this marked their first real collaboration discounting an earlier track, which was a weekend remix of Drake's song Trust Issues. A remix that Drake probably wouldn't want to bring any attention to because the weekend completely bodied it and left auto-tune Drizzy holding his dick like a sucker. Obviously, the success of their collaborations and the rising buzz of the weekend led Drake to enlist his services for the new album Take Care, both as an official feature on the songs The Ride and Crew Love, aka She's Loving the Crew, which Drake premiered on the radio with a live phone call to the weekend where he was clout sucking him hard. I was waiting to see the next individual that would make history that could potentially span far beyond mine. And I feel like that person is on the other end of this phone with me. He goes by the name of the weekend. Shout out to Drizzy. Yeah. November 15th. In addition to those two features, The Weeknd had apparently also written a few songs off of Take Care, Shot For Me, Cameras, Good Ones Go, and Practice. And when Take Care dropped, it was a humongous W for Drake, selling over 600,000 copies first week and hitting number one on Billboard, baby. And of course, The Weeknd scored another big W for himself, being able to ride the OVO coattails. And so at this point, these Toronto boys are as thick as thieves. And after this, a few months later in May 2012, Drake is puckering up to kiss The Weeknd's little shaven butthole in an interview with the MTV News host, least likely to have the answers, Sway. In the interview, he praised The Weeknd, saying that everywhere he goes, they love him, and they constantly scream when Drake mentions him on stage. Yeah, Drizzy, say my name. Mm, yeah. And when asked about the formality of the OVO XO combined crew, Drake said that on paper, it's all currently being worked out, sparking intense speculation that The Weeknd and XO were about to sign with Drizzy Drake. Many fans felt like The Weeknd's destiny was to be at Drake's label, and Drake seemed to be showing The Weeknd so much crew love, it seemed like their partnership was a foregone conclusion. And so he continued to bring him out at numerous shows, including London's beloved festival and future outdoor virus breeding ground, Wireless. However, there would soon be trouble in Club Paradise as The Weeknd publicly dubbed Drake and his OVO crew, choosing instead to sign a big joint venture record deal with Republic in order to completely go it alone and avoid becoming yet another OVO lackey. Many people have even suggested that Drake specifically signed his OVO record label under Warner Brothers instead of the questionable bill payers cash money who Drake was signed under as a solo artist in order to specifically appease The Weeknd, who reportedly didn't want to be one Nigel signed to another Nigel, as Pusha T would say. But The Weeknd apparently elaborated saying that he had signed with Republic Records specifically with the aim of getting more pop radio play rather than branding, which he suggested other labels were good at. Vis-a-vis, -vis, I don't want that fucking owl stamped on everything that I own. And in yet another boss move after signing, The Weeknd immediately dropped a triple album titled Trilogy, a commercial repackaging of those first three mixtapes, House of Blues, Thursday, and Echoes of Silence. And this did really well, going on to move over 300,000 units, not bad, for a three disc repackaging of three old mixtapes. Hell, I've got Space Ghost perk mixtapes that I still can't sell on. However, many fans were surprised at the weekend dubbing Drake and going it solo, considering how many times Drake had shouted out their crew's OVO XO as a joint partnership. And the day that the weekend was signed, Drake shot off 
a apparently salty tweet that seemed like it was a jab at his former homie. And a month later, when OVO affiliate Johnny Rocks tweeted that there ain't no XO in OVO, many people thought that there was about to be a full-blown beef. Well, Drake must have kept that old Everlast robe handy, because from here he'd be throwing more limp wristed jabs than a Jake Paul fight. In February, started from the bottom dropped with lyrics that many people interpreted as sneak disses towards the weekend, and then in March, 5am in Toronto dropped, which also included lyrics that people thought were subliminals to the weekend. And later on, in an interview with Elliot Wilson, aka Jimmy Fallon of the rap game. <laughs> Swear this dude's got NOS addiction. But in this interview, Drake was actually pressed on these lyrics, denying that they were sneak disses and generally being pretty complimentary about the weekend. For people like thinking it has something to do with the weekend, like nah. It, and you know, I always like more power to him. I talk to him all the time, you know, and, and, and I'm looking forward to whatever he has coming in the future. However, apparently, the weekend did not get the memo, and it wouldn't take long for him to give his side of the story, eventually spilling the beans on just how he'd been treated at the OVO sweatshop, I mean studio. Now shit really hit the proverbial fan after a 2013 complex cover story interview of The Weeknd released, which for the record also included a couple of paragraphs where he was praising R. Kelly, but let's just sweep that one firmly under his 18 year old girlfriend's rug, shall we? In the interview, Weeknd basically said, I'm upset, but specifically about having had songs taken from him for Drake's Take Care album. Take care, more like take all my songs, am I right? He described an incident where apparently Drake crashed a heavy studio turned weed smoking session, where he asked The Weeknd on the spot if he could take his song the ride. And another tip it actually revealed that the song True Love was initially a weekend solo track, but apparently Drake hit him with a whole heartfelt spiel about how much that song meant to him after he'd heard it. And Weekend also apparently shared the fact that Drake had told him that he couldn't have made the album Take Care without him. Which is probably true, because even though Drake has since then tried to hide behind the fact that The Weekend was only involved with several tracks on that project, Weekend said that Drake had told him that he really wanted the entire Take Care album to incorporate The Weekend sound, which Drake seemed to convince him was in turn already inspired by his own sound, which is frankly a little bit manipulative. But to be fair to The weekend, aside from the dump truck full of salt that he poured on Drake in this interview, he suggested that he didn't feel that him and Drizzy had actually fallen out, suggesting that from day one he had made it clear that he wanted his own solo deal and that he didn't intend to sign with OVO, something that he said that Drizzy was completely fine with. And who could blame him? I mean, for the longest time, OVO had a pretty terrible reputation when it came to new artists signing on board and then having their careers fizzle out. Or worse, just becoming a songwriting vessel for Drake to leech hits off of. I mean, come on, who's actually on OVO. Party next door? Come on, the guy's been living in Drake's shadow so long he's got a vitamin D deficiency. And do you remember Majid Jordan, the forgettable falsetto from Just Hold On, We're Going Home? That guy's probably buffing the floors in Drake's mansion now. Shit, I heard that if Back and Not Nice doesn't drop a hit song in the next six months, he's going back to human trafficking. No, when you take a close look at how OVO artists have fared in their personal careers, it's absolutely no wonder that The Weeknd decided to dodge this bullet. And what better example of a career at the OVO switch shop going wrong than I Love McConey? AKA, got the club blowing up on a Tuesday. AKA, Lil Nas X in an alternate universe where that cowboy hat hadn't ruined his life. McConan actually revealed in an interview with The Fader what went down with OVO after they had decided they wanted his monster hit Tuesday in their catalog. And apparently, after they'd signed him, got what they wanted and the dust settled on that one hit. When he went to the label looking for support on his future releases, they started ducking it. And apparently Drake had even sued him for trying to get out of a potentially eight year contract that he'd signed. And if you thought that was bad enough, Apparently Drizzy and his goons even threatened him face to face in a nightclub. But to his credit, to this day, it seems like McConan is the only person to have ever got out of an OVO deal. And so with hindsight, it's clear that when The Weeknd decided not to sign with OVO, he took another big W. And so I guess now we know once and for all, your dreams ain't coming true at OVO. Now, contrary to many people's expectations, Drake and The Weeknd were actually in the studio together not long after that interview dropped. And Drake continued to show ex-crew love by bringing out The Weeknd yet again to his 2013 OVO Fest. And a month after that, Drake appeared on The Weeknd's abysmally titled album, Kiss Land. Oh, you know, Kiss Land, cause like he goes on tour and kisses lots of girls. You know, it's like being in a theme park full of kisses, a land of kisses, Kiss Land, fuck off. Maybe I'll name my next album Hard and Sock Land. Anywho, Drake popped up on the song Live For, which is a fire collab. And shortly after, after its release, Drake actually came out on stage with The Weeknd to congratulate him for the Kissland success. I'm in this bitch tonight repping that OVOXO, you know what's going on. Sir, congratulations, you now have the number one album in the country. 
and this came along with the announcement that The weekend would actually appear as an opener on the UK dates of Drake's also abysmally titled Would You Like A Tour? Nope, but as it turned out, a whole bunch of teenage girls would like a tour. And so this put Drizzy and The weekend on the road together for an extended period around March 2014. And it seemed like public communication between these two got pretty quiet over the year that followed when they were seen together hanging out with Dr. Dre at an Apple event. But The Weeknd shouted out Drake from afar on his track King of the Fall with lyrics that seemed to suggest that they had been beefing but that time they spent together on tour saw them pattern up their relationship. And in seemingly another volley of positive action, Drake dropped his own remix of The Weeknd track Tell Your Friends on his own OVO radio show, a track that has since been deleted. But never fear because from here things are about to heat up and we're gonna get into some juicy delicious beef. In 2015, a big battle for the Billboard number one slot goes down. Drake's stolen remix of Dram's Cha Cha, oh sorry, I mean his totally original single Hotline Bling, releases and takes over the world with ridiculous memes. And on the other side of the fence, we have The Weeknd's infectious, if slightly irritating, booty call anthem, The Hills, which came along with a music video that seemed to depict The Weeknd just after taking his first lesson at the Caitlyn Jenner driving school. And in the midst of this clash of the teenage girl dating titans, The Weeknd dropped an interview with The Rolling Stone, dropping even more shade on Drake's song Steal In Ways, saying that he gave up almost half of his album for Take Care, but also acknowledging Drake for shining a light on him and putting him in the position that he's in today, i.e. the position to take a giant dookie on Drake's head. Because after all was said and done, The Weeknd came out victorious, taking that top spot and relegating Drake to the number two slot usually reserved for Nicki Minaj. Even in spite of Drake's desperate pleas to his fans to give him his first number one hit of his career in his favourite month, instead his fans handed him an ornate silver-plated L. Guess his crew should be called OVO L after that one. And so after this big fat public embarrassment, it was bound to leave Drake feeling a little bit salty towards the weekend. In turn, leading him to drop a few sneak disses on the first single off of his next album, Views Summer 16, with another line about taking the X's out of his OVOs. God, I swear sometimes listening to Drake's music, it feels like I'm eating a defective bowl of alphabet soup. In response, by November, the weekend was taking sideswipes at Drake on his new song, Sidewalks, with lines talking about people who think they made him. But then a few days later, the weekend was being interviewed by by former popular radio DJ and current rich nobody, Zane Lowe, saying he preferred that both him and Drake were just both huge artists in their own right, rather than him being an underling, but then also going on to say that he would have loved to have seen a joint project between him and Drake come to fruition. OVOXO is, you know, it's always, it'll always be there. Um, but it's not there right now. It's cool to have both monsters work together, you know? As opposed okay. to like one monster and one like little guy coming in, it's like dope where, like Kanye and Jay-Z, it's like when that happened. Can it happen? Of course. Do you think it'll happen? Maybe. Which in turn was followed by some positivity with Drake plugging The Weeknd's equally stupidly titled new album Starboy on his Instagram. Because you know, he's a boy and a pop star, get it? Wow! Anyway, at this point, the Starboy album comes out and does a complete madness. Number one on Billboard, 348,000 sales in its first week. And by January of 2019, it was goddamn triple platinum. And The Weeknd is naturally popping off for several months, riding high off the massive earth shattering success of Starboy. And once a few months had gone by, the pair once again again reunited on stage in February 2017 in Germany where Drake bought The Weeknd out for his Boy Meets World tour. And they touched the stage together again in May 2017 when Drake made cameos on two stops of The Weeknd's Starboy tour, where they'd come out and play Crew Love together for the first time in years. And Drake returned the favour in August of 2017 bringing out The Weeknd to perform at the OVO Fest, seemingly choosing this moment of all moments to put The Weeknd on the spot in front of everybody and suggest that they should go through with that OVO EXO project. I want you to understand what this is. First of all, I don't, I don't I don't want to do this to you on stage, but I feel like that OVO EXO project has to happen at some point. I just want to say that. But unfortunately, as you all know, we would never get to see that project because in 2017, this beef would take a whole new dimension. And as is the case with most of Drake's beef, at the center of the disagreement is one very attractive and young female. Now, come on, what's the point of being the sexiest, most in-demand R&B star in the world if you can't pipe down hot young model chicks? And so The weekend had set his sights on failed equestrian, sentient mannequin, and the second hottest girl in the Hadid family, Bella Hadid. Now, by this point in the Drake weekend saga around 2017, The weekend had already been in an 18-month relationship with Bella Hadid. They'd first been rumored to have actually been involved around April 2015, after The weekend had apparently asked Bella to pose for his Beauty Behind the Madness front cover art. Apparently, 
concocting this front cover photo shoot purely as an excuse to meet this young woman who he fancied on some real Harvey Weinstein shit. But when that didn't work because Bella turned down the offer, apparently The Weeknd was persistent and continued to seek a face-to-face -face meeting with her, with him saying rather ambiguously that from there the relationship kind of fell in his lap. Which is pretty impressive because, I mean, it usually takes me months of stalking to get a woman to fall into my lap slash van. From there, The Weeknd and Bella Hadid were romantically linked on numerous occasions, initially with them being spotted hanging out together at Coachella in 2015, and they'd apparently been hanging out with Bella's more famous sister, Gigi, going on double dates with her and her partner, Cody Simpson, who are apparently the son of Ivan Drago from Rocky IV. Can you imagine how terrible the dinner table conversation is at that double date? Oh, it's so great to hang around with another famous douche couple as well. After this, we should go and hunt the poor for sport. From there, they were spotted holding hands together outside the Alexander Wang show in September of 2015, with The weekend publicly proving just how much of a shitty boyfriend he is. I mean, look at this picture. Look how cold she looks. And he's just chilling there with a big coat on. And he's literally got her stepping in a puddle. I mean, this is an 18-year-old international supermodel. And you got the New York City rainwater making direct contact with this girl's feet. How are you going to lick those toes later when she's got dried garbage water between them? Disgusting. No wonder girls think men are trash. Luckily, a month later, when they were seen together again, she'd learned her lesson and gone out with a sweater. With The weekend pictured here seemingly saying, no, no, I don't share jackets. Around this time, The weekend also revealed in a Rolling Stone interview that he'd actually bought her a dog for her 19th birthday. Something I've always felt is a pretty manipulative gift. Can't leave me now, bitch. You'll upset the dog. As well as popping up with her and her mum for 19th birthday celebrations. And in November, they popped up together at an event at the Hard Rock in New York. Seen here being told by Ed Sheeran that if he doesn't close his mouth, a goddamn fly's gonna land in it. And although that initial fake album cover photo shoot went nowhere, Bella Hadid was eventually tricked into working with The Weeknd officially on his December 2015 music video for In The Night, putting her in a bathtub of roses and I can only assume more cold New York City rainwater. Hey, you know what they say, treat them mean, keep them cold. However, Bella Hadid must have got tired from the constant rainwater boarding as rumors that they were going on a break begun circulating around Christmas. Although for a moment after it, these rumors were quashed when the couple was seen hanging out on DJ Khaled's yacht. Wait a minute, is that DJ Khaled or has French Montana just got fat? Apparently on this trip, The Weeknd was trying to outsmart the paparazzi by wearing camouflage and styling his own hair so that it also functioned as a baseball hat. Meanwhile, Bella was rocking a grey set of Yeezys and a baggy black hoodie straight out of the 2015 basic bitch starter pack from Zara. They were then seen at the February 2016 Grammys, an appearance that many considered to be a show of strength after the rumours of their initial split, with The Weeknd proving once and for all it's okay for a woman to date a shorter man. You know, as long as he's the most rich and successful R&B artist in the world. I'ma keep practicing my singing for them tall beauties, baby. They were then seen canoodling at the LA Fashion Awards in March 2016. I assume that he's whispering to her, bitch, if you act right, I'm gonna buy you a warm ass coat. They were then seen courtside at a Lakers game in April, photographed here moments after Bella asked him if she was still getting that coat, and again in May 2016, where his height seemed to get the better of him, and he refused to be photographed unless he could stand awkwardly at four steps higher than her. Hey, who do you think's having the most fun in this relationship? Just ask him. Honestly, he looks like a simp that's paid for an OnlyFans meet and greet, and I'm not sure she can feel her face either. And after that show of solidarity, they were seen traveling to Tokyo together where the weekend was promoting his Starboy album, where they were photographed with Weekend seemingly four years early to wearing a face mask in public. Though actually on more consideration, I think he was just trying to avoid catching a terminal case of basic bitch itis from Bella. And there he is celebrating her 20th birthday in his velour jacket. But within a month of that photo being taken, things were falling apart once again. I can only assume because she didn't get that jacket she was promised. In November 2016, they eventually broke up citing work commitments, but saying publicly that they still had a lot of love for each other and would remain friends. But not before Bella Hadid had publicly thrown some salt in the weekend's wounds by publicly fronting on him in her underwear at the Victoria Secret Fashion Runway show where he was set to perform and she was set to walk the runway in front of him. But never fear, apparently being paraded in your underwear unable to speak whilst your famous ex performs next to you is empowering. Who'd have thunk it? Oh yeah, you work it girl. You're really showing him. You don't need no man. You certainly don't need no coat. But despite what the media were saying about this moment, apparently they weren't actually on bad terms. With Bella coming out not long after this saying in an interview with Teen Vogue that she'd always respect and love him. And well, what better way to show your love and respect for your former partner than by immediately shacking up with their most famous op? Come on, it's Drizzy Drake, fuckboy of the year. Would you expect any less? Not long before that last public showing of love between Drake and The Weeknd at the 2017 OVO Fest, Drake and Bella Hadid had been linked romantically in June 2017, after being spotted leaving an LA nightclub after an evening of partying together, with anonymous sources stating that Drake definitely 100% hooked up with Bella, and apparently causing The Weeknd and the EXO camp to feel like Drake had broken the bro code. And so apparently the bro code only applies to women, but not hit songs, good to know. And so over the following months, while a lot 
of Drake's romantic activity was kept a secret as his love child, in October we'd get another glimpse behind the curtain, as Drake continued publicly courting Bella Hadid, throwing her a lavish 21st birthday party in New York. Reports say that Drake was actually ecstatic when he realised that he could reuse those 12th birthday balloons that he bought for his other girlfriend. And following this, Bella Hadid's mum was questioned about the Drake relationship on TV, giving a response that was too uncomfortable for it not to be true. There are rumours that Bella is dating Drake. Is that are true? Are you kidding? What, what are we here? <laughs> <laughs> this is like... He threw her a big 21st birthday party he last did? night. Really? Yes, you were there. Oh, I didn't know. Like are they? Are they? Are they together? Are they together? I don't. I mean, they're friends. They're friends. Yes. All right, very good. Now, realistically, this is all the solid evidence that we have that anything ever went on between these two on paper. But it's likely plenty went on behind the scenes in secret, and I'm sure we can all imagine sweaty Drake piping down Bella Hadid while the weekend sits at home crying, writing sad songs about the whole situation that Drake will probably come and steal anyway. I mean, honestly, I don't know why these guys are getting so hung up on Bella Hadid. I mean, yeah, sure, she's hot, skinny, and young, but she's also basic AF because from her famously cringeworthy interview. It seems like all she's looking for is a guy with good sneaks. They better be fresh, you okay. know? If homeboy is coming through with these, right. it's quiet. Yeah, no, right. it's quiet for him. But, <laughs> like, if he comes through in, like, these, yeah. you got some Air Maxes out here, yeah. you got some Jordans, homeboy's gonna, like, get it. Suck a dick for truck fit, she's about to take a semen deposit for some foam posits. And of course, considering how sought after Drake's OVO Jordan sneakers are, I can imagine she sucked the skin off of his short but surprisingly wide dot. Anyway, apparently this short-term fling actually went nowhere, and the rumour was that Drake basically ghosted her after he got what he wanted, because he probably made his point and poured enough salt in the weekend's wounds by this stage. But as is often the case with Drake, he seems to get into these situations, treat these women wrong, and then catch feelings when they dub him right back. I guess once Bella got that auto-tune piping and the rare OVO Jordans that she was seeking from Drake, this was a two-way arrangement, and it seemed like once Bella had gotten what she wanted from the situation, i.e. some Drizzy D, some free Jordans, and some get back at the weekend, she seemed to have no problems ditching Drake either. Now, when she'd actually initially split up with the weekend, it didn't take him long to find another hot, young, famous star to have a public rebound with. And so after that breakup in January 2017, he was spotted having a PDA with former Disney star, former Justin Bieber's personal fleshlight, and the creator of the only revival album worse than Eminem. M's Selena Gomez. Apparently this prompted a petty unfollowing by Bella Hadid. Isn't it cute when girls have ops too? With many assuming that an IG post of her flipping off the camera days later was actually a response. Though I personally see it as a message of Sea World, I finally got a coat. Yeah sure it doesn't have sleeves but that's all that Drake was willing to spend. Fuck you. And by March both Selena Gomez and The Weeknd had both retaliated by unfollowing Bella Hadid on IG. Yeah that shower. I mean I would make a joke about how immature this was but let's not forget the fact that these women were basically children before Drake and The Weeknd grew Sorry, I mean met them. Anyway, before long, Bella Hadid was linked to The weekend once again. Only a month after October's very own had been finessed out of a birthday budget for Bella Hadid's 21st, rumours surfaced that The weekend was back in Bella's life after the 10-month relationship that he had with Selena Gomez went south because she was getting back with Bieber. Now, according to some sources, that breakup might have had something to do with The weekend not making enough time for Gomez when she was going through her health problems, but in his defence, it seemed like he was cancelling shows to be at her side. But then again, apparently the person that gave her a kidney no longer even fucking speaks to her because she refused to stop partying and drinking alcohol following the transplant. Wow. Anywho, in a seemingly salty move around the time of the weekend supposedly getting back with Bella Hadid, Drake's pettiness got the better of him in November when he sent an aggy reply to somebody suggesting on IG that the weekend had written all of Take Care. Drake's passive aggressive reply at least copped to the weekend co-writing Shot For Me and Practice, as well as acknowledging his features on Crew Love and The Ride, but downplaying the weekend's contribution to the overall project. Anyway, in the months that followed, the weekend was spotted leaving Bella Hadid's New York City apartment and rumours were flying that they were back together again. Rumour has it that he was heard saying into his phone as he was leaving her apartment, look this bitch said I can't put it in unless I get her a coat, just find me one. From here, the news on their relationship went quiet, until they were supposedly spotted in April having some PDA at a Coachella after party at Poppy nightclub where she was seen sitting on his lap. However, Bella herself replied to this, responding to the Instagram rumour on E! News with the shaggy defence, aka it wasn't me. And well, apparently things weren't that exclusive, because the following day, the weekend was supposedly getting cosy 
with another one of Justin Bieber's exes, Chantal Jeffries. God, I swear all of these models and fuckboys are just in one big rotating Hollywood dirty sex harem. How do I join? Anyway, obviously The weekend was being very level-headed and considered about this relationship drama, considering the fact he ended up crying on stage at Coachella. But then again, it is pretty likely that he'd be getting emotional about this. After all, the previous year he'd actually gone to Coachella with Gomez, and before that going with Bella Hadid. Anyway, so the Chantel Jeffries move was probably just another petty sideswipe at Justin Bieber for stealing Selena Gomez from him. But it didn't take The weekend long to patch up that broken heart with a hot young flesh band-aid. And in May, him and Bella were photographed together once again at the Cannes Festival, first apparently kissing at a Cannes after party for Magnum and Alexander Wang, which is pretty nice, but I think just before this he was doing cocaine in the toilet with Adam Sandler's girlfriend. After this, rumours begun spreading that they'd secretly been dating for a while, and rumours continued to circulate later on in the Cannes Festival when The weekend was spotted with Bella in a screening for Ashes the Purest White. The weekend tried to downplay this with a post saying that he was just there to watch a movie, but I think that sentiment was undercut by him walking in there with a popcorn box that had a hole cut in the bottom of it. Classic move, that. Also in May, The weekend was in the crowd as Bella hit the runway in a fashion for relief event. Yeah, probably the face I'd pull as well if I saw my missus wearing a dress made a loose change. You need to get your money up, Bella. In June, they were spotted strolling together in Paris, and you can tell they were serious about rekindling that relationship because they followed each other once again on Instagram. Wow, what a commitment. And well, this newfound rekindling apparently got underneath Drizzy's skin. Because by the end of June, Drake was dropping even more sneak disses on his Scorpion album, with many suggesting that the song Finesse from Scorpion was actually all about Bella Hadid. Or more specifically, him finessing The weekend by smashing her, with lines that seemed to suggest that he'd wished he'd knocked her up instead of Sophie Brousseau and others referencing her hotter sister, Gigi, as well as saying that he would cancel things to see her, possibly another sneak diss about The weekend and Bella having broken up over scheduling issues. To which Bella came out responding to the song saying that it was disrespectful and reaffirming that they're just friends. Yeah, just friends with Drake, pull my other one. Then in July, more speculation was fueled as Bella posted IG snaps of her at The weekend's house, seemingly showing two tiny dog houses outside, which I believe him and Drake sleep in when Bella's mad at them. She also popped up in July 2018 showing off a picture of The weekend at an art gallery calling him her muse forever. Well, except for the five months that she was smashing Drake. But other than those, muse forever. In August, they were at Kylie Jenner's 21st birthday party, and by October, they were kissing in public again. In November, The weekend was cheering on Bella at the Victoria's Secret runway show alongside her mum, seen here praying he doesn't ask any questions about the nice OVO Jordan she had on. And right up till 2019, Bella and The weekend were thick as thieves, once again rocking their camos for The weekend's 29th birthday in February. But unfortunately, by August, they had split up once again for good. With sources is saying the split was caused by arguments and distance between the couple. But I think what we all know it was really about was that distance between Bella and the new coach she'd been promised. And even though they were spotted together at her 22nd birthday party in October, sources say that that was just as friends. And lyrics from the Weekend's After Hours album seem to reference the breakup, with the tracks Heartless, Blinding Lights, and After Hours having lines referencing Hadid coming back after he'd split up with Gomez. In January 2019, The weekend supposedly sneaked this Drake over his secret love child on his feature on the Gustafstein track Lost in the Fire, saying that he could only have a baby with the right one and that he could never hide one. That is cold-blooded shit. And apparently Drake was so butthurt by this side swipe, he decided to unfollow The weekend on IG too. Not very gangster move, is it, Drake? I thought you had mob ties. Why don't you deal with this like a real gangster and get one of Jay Prince's sons to make an IG post about it? Anyway, from there, The weekend took even more jabs at Drake, with his feature on some rapper that I've never even heard of called N N Nav? 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 Nav's track, Price on My Head, saying that he's beefing with himself and people on Drake's side would ride for the weekend. A line which, when it was said in the music video, was apparently accompanied by a cameo of OVO affiliate Giller. But in spite of these constant sideswipes from the weekend, by the end of 2019, Drake was being positive on the past events when he appeared on the Rap Radar podcast with Elliot Wilson. Sorry, I mean Elliot. <laughs> Wilson, elaborating that he's still happy for the weekend's success and suggesting that his only regret was not communicating better. To this day, I'm always excited, always super happy for, for all those guys. Um, and I never like had any resentment towards like, oh, you didn't stay on OVO. My thing, I never expected able to stay under OVO as soon as I heard him once express that he wanted to do his own thing. We probably wasted seven years not communicating with each other when we had something something beautiful going on, you know, like OVOXO still could have been I think, yeah, a yeah. thing and still will be a thing, by the way. As well as seeming to suggest that he had something to apologize for, which I'd probably wager is something to do with him smashing the weekend's ex, but 
I'm no detective. I have my fair share of shit to apologize for, as 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 does he. We've we've obviously had our you know our our, our bumps in the road, but Drake said on Rap Radar that once again he was bummed out about having deprived the fans of the possibility of a full OVO EXO album, and apparently, at least from Drake's side, the beef was considered fully squashed when he released his end of 2019 track War with a lyric referencing that OVO affiliate Giller, who the weekend had shown in that Price of My Head video, as well as several other OVO EXO crew members from Toronto who all have overlapping friendships. And so whilst that would suggest that at least from Drake's perspective things are completely cool with The Weeknd, as far as I can tell we haven't necessarily seen anything substantive from The weekend side apart from those occasional side swipes to suggest that he thinks the beef is squashed. But then again who knows now that he's moved on from Bella Hadid, perhaps The Weeknd has had enough time to heal and get over the fact that Drake broke the bro code by smashing his ex. Hell, who knows. So does Drake hate The Weeknd? Doesn't seem like it. Does The Weeknd hate Drake? Maybe a little bit, who knows. In fact there's pretty much only one thing that I know to be true. As a single man, stuck in quarantine with absolutely zero dating prospects and seething with jealousy at these two jammy motherfuckers and their supermodels. I think we all know what the real title of this video should have been. Everybody, head on over to twitch.tv slash traplawross. If you're watching this on Premiere, I'm going to be there right now answering your questions, chit-chatting, getting hated on, all that good stuff. So head on over, make sure you follow your boy, make sure you subscribe to your boy on Twitch if you can. I appreciate that. Also want to give a huge shout out to the Patreon gang. Gang, that's Ban Johnson, Jay, Sebastian Andres Laredo, Sean Anderson, Vampires for Hire, Roberto Rosas, Mathis Martin, Deshaun Campbell, Antonio Groza, Bash the Prince, Chris J, Claire Audient, DJ Fred 100, Griffin Fuller, Henry Bryant, Jaden Cho, Jason Wyman, Javier Gonzalez, Jessica Simmons, Kizzlebot, Naraj Shukla, Otaku VS, Penis Bag Penis Face, Pyromancer, Vivi, Wilson Psychedelic and everyone else's names you see on screen right now. Thank you for your support and any money from Patreon this month. I will make sure I redonate to a worthy cause fighting this ongoing health crisis because it sucks. Make sure that you go and follow your boy at Traplaw Ross on Instagram. Twitter, SoundCloud, go and follow my Spotify playlist in the description. If you're really feeling generous, I would massively appreciate it. You are the gang gang. And we've got a Discord now. Make sure you go and follow the Discord, baby, so that we can have late night chit chats after I'm done Twitch streaming, baby. It's going to be popping. Thank you for watching. Shout out the gang gang. I really appreciate your support. And until next time, a peace out.